Around 240 million years ago, the creatures that we now call dinosaurs began to walk on Earth that was very different than the one that we live in today. And of course, we're so separated by time that we can't directly observe them, but we've been finding dinosaur fossils for thousands of years. Still, it wasn't until the 19th century that paleontology became a field of study, and we started to understand anything about these creatures that once walked where we do today. And that early study of paleontology was actually full of conflict. Scientists arguing over what these fossils were, what they represented, and what the creatures might have looked like. Paleontology is and always has been, by necessity, a field that requires interpretation from often incomplete remains. And our understanding of the creatures that we call dinosaurs has transformed dramatically over time. Though separated by millions of years, our two species have something important in common, and that is the study of their bones has become a part of human history. History that deserves to be remembered. Fossils have been known since antiquity, and in the 5th or 6th century BC, Greek philosopher Xenophanes of Colophon concluded from shell fossils that the land must have once been covered by an ocean. Throughout antiquity and the Middle Ages, various theories of petrification were put forward by thinkers all over the world. In the 16th century, wealthy Europeans began gathering collections of various fossil objects and displaying them in special cupboards, largely as a hobby. Natural philosophers of the period sought to explain the fossils in many ways, often quasi-scientific and even mythical. Leonardo da Vinci made significant strides towards a modern understanding of fossils, particularly in recognizing that fossils had to be remains of organic bodies and not inorganic processes. The Age of Reason in the 17th century brought more serious analysis of fossils. In 1665, Robert Hooke published Micrographia, in which he studied various items with a microscope, including petrified wood. He argued against the idea that fossils were created by some extraordinary plastic virtue latent in the earth itself, and instead thought these represented life that had once been on earth. Danish scientist Nicholas Steno determined that what were called tongue stones were actually fossilized shark teeth. Steno also understood that the strata in stone he was studying came from layers of sediment, and that fossils were not formed within the stone itself. However, Steno was bound by the biblical belief that Earth was only a few thousand years old, and he determined the fossils must have been caused by the Great Flood. It was difficult for philosophers and early scientists in Europe to come to grips with fossils that didn't resemble living creatures because they didn't believe in extinction. There was a strong belief, especially in England, in the immutability of species. New species could not arise, nor could they go extinct. In the 1670s, a femur of a megalosaurus was sent to a naturalist named Robert Plott at Oxford, and he correctly identified it as a femur, but then he determined that it could only possibly be the femur of some sort of very large human, perhaps a giant or a titan. In the 19th century, naturalists began to identify the first prehistoric creatures. In 1770, bones from a huge animal were excavated at a quarry in the Netherlands, which was named Mosasaurus in 1822. Large bones from Argentina were identified as a sloth-like creature dubbed Megatherium. In 1796, a paper examined mammoth bones and showed that they did not come from any extant elephant species, proving that they were the remains of an extinct animal. On the British shoreline now called the Jurassic Coast, locals have been selling curios to locals for decades that they dug out of the unstable cliffs. They sold snake stones and devil's fingers that were actually ammonite and belemnite fossils, respectively. Young Mary Anning and her family were part of this tradition, but in 1811, her brother dug up something special, a four-foot-long ichthyosaur skull that looked nothing like anything living. Mary found the rest of the skeleton a few months later. They sold the fossil, and it was eventually ended up in the hands of the British Museum, bought as a crocodile in fossil state. Mary Anning took over the family's fossil collection business, and despite limited schooling, became an important figure in the paleontology field. In 1823, she discovered the first complete fossil of a plesiosaurus, and a few years later, the first pterosaur in England, labeled a flying dragon when it was shown at the British Museum. While her gender hindered her ability to be taken seriously, her store sold many fossils to important museums, scientists, and wealthy patrons. She was friends with another early paleontologist, William Buckland. She suggested to Buckland that the strange conical objects called bezoar stones found in ichthyosaur fossil abdomens might be fossilized excrement. Buckland would dub them coprolites, and he used the coprolites to imagine the ancient food chain. Buckland played an important role in reconciling what geologists were observing in the biblical tales of the flood. Though sedimentation was definitely caused by floods, it could not have been caused by the Great Flood, which lasted only about a year. He believed that Noah's flood could not be responsible for more than a few strata they were studying. 
While initially he attributed some layers to the universal deluge, eventually he determined that the evidence was more likely caused by glaciation. While he was president of the Geological Society of London, he announced the discovery of fossils of a huge reptile, which he called Megalosaurus, Great Lizard. In 1822, Mary Mantell supposedly discovered some unusual fossilized teeth while traveling with her husband Gideon. Inspired by Anning, Gideon had begun collecting both marine and terrestrial fossils in Sussex, England. The popular story about his wife is uncertain. Gideon did say that Mary had discovered the teeth, but much later claimed that he had found them himself. In his notes, he said he had discovered the bones of an animal of the lizard tribe of enormous magnitude. Mantell was convinced that the teeth were of an unknown herbivorous species, but other scientists were less sure. In France, one scientist dismissed them as rhinoceros teeth, while at the Royal Society, Buckland thought they were fish teeth, or not ancient at all. Despite ridicule, Mantell maintained that the teeth were from prehistory and sought a modern analogy. Finally, he was shown the skeleton of an iguana, which had similar teeth. His discovery was finally accepted in 1825. He thought the creature could have been as much as 60 feet long, and he first suggested calling it Iguanosaurus, meaning Iguana Lizard. A friend gently suggested either Iguana Ides, meaning Iguana Like, or Iguana Dawn, meaning Iguana Tooth. A more complete specimen from Maidstone, later re identified as Mantellosaurus, inspired Mantell to draw a restoration of the creature. When faced with a small conical horn, he again looked to modern animals as to what it could be and put it on the nose, like a rhinoceros. In 1822, the editor of a French journal coined the word paleontology to describe the work that was being done on fossils. In 1831, Mantel published The Age of Reptiles, a paper that summarized evidence for a prolonged period in the ancient past when huge reptiles like Iguanodon were dominant. The following year, he bought fossils found during work at a quarry, which he eventually identified as an armored dinosaur that he called Haliosaurus. At the time, it was the most complete non-avian dinosaur ever found. In 1841, prominent scientist Richard Owen put the three species, Iguanodon, Megalosaurus, and Haliosaurus, into a new order, Dinosauria. Owen was the driving force behind the creation of a separate museum of natural history, but had strained relations with his peers, especially Mantell. He claimed to have discovered Iguanodon and may have pushed to keep some of Mantell's papers unpublished. Owen described dinosaurs as the most perfect modifications of the reptilian type, and that they would have been the most impressive reptiles that this world has ever witnessed in oviparous or cold-blooded creatures. The announcement was met with excitement in scientific circles, and it began to interest the public as well. In 1851, the Great Exhibition opened in Hyde Park in London, housed an enormous crystal palace, an iron and plate glass structure. The exhibition housed all manner of inventions from different countries to display the advancements of the Industrial Revolution. The building was later moved to Sydenham Hall. In 1852, Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins, a sculptor and natural history artist who had been assistant superintendent during the Great Exhibition, was commissioned to create an ambitious sculpture park of extinct creatures based on recently collected fossils. Mantell was unable to play a role as he had died from an opium overdose in 1852. He had suffered from chronic pain uh, following a carriage accident that had injured his spine in 1841. And so Owen was chosen as the scientific advisor for the project. It's important to remember that these were the very early days of paleontology, and these sculptures were to be the first publicly displayed interpretations. By 1852, no complete skeleton of Iguanodon had been found, and there was some disagreement as to which bones went where. These bones were not found intact, but often damaged before or after extrication and in disorganized piles. There is no intact cranium of Iguanodon, Megalosaurus, and perhaps only a partial a part of Hyliosaurus. What exactly these creatures might have looked like was very much a matter of conjecture and had a lot to do with how the discovered bones were compared to modern types. One example is the length of an iguanodon's tail. If equal to the ratio in a modern iguana, the animal could be 60 or 70 feet long, but some believed it was shorter and that iguanodon was only around 30 feet long. With the information at hand, Owen had determined that these dinosaurs were quadrupedal and pachyderm-like in order to support their massive weights. While Owen provided scientific descriptions and his own inferences on the creatures, Hawkins had considerable leeway over details, such as the appearance of their skin and faces. He also studied the fossils himself. Ultimately, he made 33 extinct animals, four of which were dinosaurs. He also made ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, and various extinct animals, including the South African Megaloceros. The sheer size of the sculptures meant many of them were cast on site, with a temporary workshop set up around them. The four dinosaurs included one each of Megalosaurus and Hyliosaurus, and two of Iguanodon. 
The Iguanodon represented two slightly different interpretations, with one standing tall on four legs, while the second is lying on its belly and leaning on a branch in a pose not unlike that of the actual iguana. Both other dinosaurs are somewhat similar, with the Megalosaurus looking something like a straight-legged crocodile and the Heliosaurus positioned so that viewers could only see its spiked and armored backside. None of them look particularly familiar or identifiable by today's reconstructions, but at the time they represented a reasonably scientific interpretation. One important caveat could be that as early as 1849, Mantell had argued that Iguanodon had smaller front limbs, adapted for seizing and pulling down the foliage branches of trees. Famously, on December 31st, 1853, Hawkins, Owens, and others had a New Year's dinner party inside the Iguanodon. While no photographs exist of the event, there are around 20 people there, according to Hawkins, including a member of the press who published an image of the event a week later. They ate inside the standing Iguanodon, although images and descriptions suggest that there may also have been a table outside the sculpture to fit everyone. A stage had to be climbed to get close enough to the unfinished piece to actually sit in it, and it's unknown if they sat in the statue itself or perhaps in the statue's mold. The whole dining area was covered by a large tent, which bore the names of some of the most illustrious paleontologists of the day, including both Mantell and Buckland. The full exhibit was meant to be displayed in a rough timeline, with three islands representing three distinct eras, the first Paleozoic, the next Mesozoic, and the finally Cenozoic. The Paleozoic included a limestone cliff showing different strata, though the current cliff is a reconstruction as the original was destroyed. The original enclosure could have the water level rise and fall, thus hiding or illuminating different creatures. A mosasaur hides along the shoreline and various mammals hide among the foliage. Hawkins' funding was cut before he had finished all of his planned sculptures, and he was forced to abandon his plans to create a mammoth or a mastodon, among others. Initially, the exhibit was a huge head, attracting a huge number of visitors and introducing them possibly for the first time to creatures they had never before imagined. Enormous and painstakingly detailed, the prehistoric animals were unfamiliar, but rendered to appear real. It's difficult to describe to a modern audience what the experience must have been like for visitors in Victorian England. They were so popular that small versions of the sculptures were sold for educational use. Prince Albert, Queen Victoria, visited the park several times. Unfortunately for the park, knowledge of dinosaurs quickly proliferated. In 1878, 38 iguanodon individuals were found in Belgium, which proved that the horn was actually a specialized thumb and that the creatures had smaller forelimbs. Those bones were initially displayed standing like a kangaroo, which today also has been discarded in favor of a quadrupedal stance again. Megalosaurus approached its modern theropod stance based on related species that began to appear, especially in the United States, although no full skeleton of Megalosaurus has ever been found. Nothing more has been found of Heliosaurus, although the discovery of Ankylosaurus has heavily influenced how it is now depicted. The sculptures called the Crystal Palace Dinosaurs can still be viewed in Orchard Park, London today, although they're largely gawked at for the silliness of what Victorian era people thought dinosaurs looked like. But to be fair, our understanding of dinosaurs changes very quickly. The dinosaur toys that I played with when I was a kid are generally considered to be horribly outdated based on our current understanding of what we think dinosaurs look like. And it's not like those old interpretations weren't valuable. The Crystal Palace dinosaurs introduced Londoners to new discoveries and creatures and ideas that they probably never heard of before, and that helped to draw attention and resources so that there could be more research that would help us better understand prehistory. The versions of dinosaurs popularized in the early and mid 20th century films, which replaced the silly depictions of the Victorians, have in turn themselves come to be seen as the silly depictions of a less enlightened era. But these changing interpretations are important. The interpretations of these fossils has changed so much over time that the change in interpretation has itself become history. Part of the long history of the human effort to understand our place in the world. Millions of years after their extinction, people are still fascinated by dinosaurs. That nexus between natural history and human history. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.